Today's featured sustainable brown girl is Jasmine Sanders. She's a climate scientist, stra strategist, and advocate. She's the executive director of Our Climate, which is a climate change advocacy organization that, up that uplifts young people to make a global impact on a grassroots level. Jasmine strives to raise awareness to the intersecting effects of climate change and the communities of color who are disproportionately affected. It is such a pleasure to have you on today, Jasmine. Thank you so much. I'm so excited about being here. Yes. So, you know, just reading your bio, I learned that you have a graduate degree in tropical marine biology. You've worked for a lobbying firm on Capitol Hill advocating for agricultural and environmental issues, and you've written legislative briefs for the U.S. House of Representatives Science, Space, and Technology Committee. You are obviously very passionate and educated about environmentalism, so I'm very curious to learn how the girl from Monroe, Louisiana became interested in environmentalism. Yeah. Um... It's really funny because I was talking um, with one of my best friends, Jasmine, and um, she, it's, I think it's always funny to hear other people's perspectives of yourself. And she was just saying how she was talking to someone about me and said, it's not a surprise that Jasmine works on climate change because she always loved the outdoors. Um, mm -hmm. I was the kid who was always outdoors. Um, and I didn't shy away from it. Um, you know, all of our Girl Scout trips, I love the outdoor activities. Um, but for me, I didn't really get into climate change and environmentalism until I was older. Um, I grew up saying I wanted to be a doctor. And it was when um, life changed in 2005 when Hurricane Katrina hit the shores of Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. for me, it was about um, seeing all of the devastation, um, be showcased around the world through news clips. Um, you know, people all of a sudden becoming aware to the levels of poverty within New Orleans, um, and realizing for the first time ever that it's not just a good time, you know, it's not just Mardi mm -hmm. Gras. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was seeing people flee away from their homes due to a climatic disaster, um, many of them, in fact, um, there were one over 1 million people displaced by Hurricane Katrina alone. Wow. Um, over 40% of them did not return back to their home, um, wow. not, even, not even their city. Um, so this is something that really shook something up inside of me. Um, and at that time, it was, how can I help, you know? Um, I still didn't know, well, I could work in this. I, I could do something in this. Um, so really for me, it came through, um, through college and I played soccer in college. Um, my junior year after practice one day, I, um, I was still actually on the sidelines and we were putting up all of the equipment and getting water and just talking. And all of a sudden, um, I was having a major stroke. Um, wow. And so life just changed in a moment. Um, and when that happened, um, I remember the first time um, in the hospital when they finally saw all the damage and they said, you know, like you've had a major stroke. My question to them was not like, okay, what does rehab look like? It was, what do I, uh, when can I get back on the field? Mm -hmm. I, you know, like my thought process was not in, oh, there has to be rehab for this. No. Um, so while I was rehabbing for nine months um, and I got released to, I was able to walk and run again. Um, I got released to play my last year of soccer. Um, I also, I realized through all of that rehab that I didn't want to be in the medical field. I'd been on the other side of the table for so long. I was like, this is not what I want to do. Um, I also didn't want to spend the, so many years of my life in school um, mm -hmm. before before getting work done, before making an impact on the world. Right. Um, I, I think medical doctors are phenomenal and they're great, but I just knew this is no longer for me. 
Um, and so I convinced my parents. <laughs> um, so after a whole lot of rehab and, you know, like scaring the heck out of them with the stroke, um, I convinced them I want to go study abroad in Belize. And wow. I went for a summer and we were in the rainforest, in the jungle. Um, we were in Southwater Key. It was one early, early morning and I free dove on a coral reef. And as I was coming up, the sun was rising behind the reef. Wow. And it was as if God was saying to me, this is what you need to do. Wow. And I was like, God, that's your voice. I didn't know that's what you <laughs> sounded like. <laughs> you know, like you believe, but like you've yeah. never heard an actual voice. I mean, like literally heard an actual voice. Like I'm watching wow. a movie and, and um, I, I just went with it. I said, okay, this, you know, like clearly I'm, you know, this is a beautiful setting. I hear God's voice for the first time. I must be in the right place. Um, so I went back to my college advisor after that summer and I told her no to medical school. Nope. I'm not going there anymore. And, um, I want to study marine biology. Um, but not just study marine biology. I want to leave the country to study marine biology. <laughs> um, so there was a whole lot of other convincing that I had to do to uh, my family. Um, in fact, despite me being always the adventurous child and like where they would pick me up from camp and my question to them would be like, so when's the next camp? <laughs> Love my family, but I was just so adventurous and just wanted to do things. Yeah. So despite all of that, when I told them like, yeah, I'm leaving the country for grad school, they were like, really? Like, you're really doing that? And I'm like, yeah, like, I mean, what's the big deal? Um, but that's my independence. You know, I'm, I'm just very independent. And I think that helps with um, people being driven and motivated. And also when you're trying to make change, especially in a social justice issue, you, you've got to be very independent. And um, you're, you're, your voice is key, which mm -hmm. leads to where I really got into climate justice advocacy. And that was when I was overseas. Um, so I studied at Essex in England. Mm -hmm. And through that program, um, we actually, um, one of the reasons why I chose it is that you had the ability to do your research in Indonesia, which is one of the world's biodiversity hotspots. Oh. Now, I mean, like, who would pass that up? Like, you're studying abroad and you get to study abroad while you're studying abroad? Duh, yes, I'm that's going amazing. here. <laughs> um, so I was in Indonesia, loving life, uh, diving three times a day. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it was absolutely beautiful. But what really got me was the sociocultural aspect of it. And it was working with the Bajo people. Um, Bajo people are also known as water nomads. Um, for decades, they had lived on their boats. That was their culture. That was their way of life. They did not live on land. Um, unfortunately, there have been some very controversial government programs that have come out that have forced them to, they can no longer live on their boat. Um, wow. They have to live on a piece of land, um, but they don't have the same citizenship rights. So talking to them about this, talking to them about what's going on in the ocean. Um, I had older generations, um, people in their 80s and 90s able to tell me, Jasmine, there's no more fish in the sea. Mm -hmm. When I was growing up, there were so many fish in the sea, so many different types of fish. Because if you imagine, if you live on a coast or you live on an island, what are you eating? You're eating fish all of the time. Right. Um, when I was there, we didn't eat different types of fish. We ate tuna, cooked any sort of way that you can think of it being cooked three times a day. That's what I ate. Wow. Um, and I mean, it was very healthy, but like I wanted a variety, you know, <laughs> <Right>. so, <laughs> you know, um, and then you had little kids. Uh, I worked a lot with um, little girls. In fact, I have a picture on my credit card of them um, oh. still. And it's, it, they were a group of girls at that time. They were like seven to 12 years old. And a lot of them wanted to go off to the big island to go to college and study. 
um, conservation and marine biology and bring back to the village sustainable best practices. Um, yeah. These are the things that little kids are wanting and little girls are wanting to do. Um, so it was very, um, it was very inspirational actually mm-hmm. for, um, for me. And I knew throughout all of these conversations and relationships that I was forming that I have a voice. Like I had always known I loved talking to people, but I didn't know that my voice was my gift. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize that the power of my gift has. And so once I learned that in Indonesia, I was like, well, I need to be in policy and advocacy. Like that's where I need to be. Um, So use all of this training. And that is why I say I'm a climate scientist, strategist, and advocate because it's all intertwined for me. Um, If I did not have my science background, I would not be, I don't think I would be as impactful as I am today um, because I have those analytical skills. I have those, those science skills. So I'm able to look at different policies and solutions and say, well, where's the science behind this? Um, But it's also um, you know, the sociocultural aspect of things for me is very important. We have to humanize the issue of climate change. Um, and I have been in DC now for almost 10 years and, um, it's been a wild ride. Yeah. It sounds like (laughs) it. Oh my gosh. You've been all over the world. You've had so many different experiences, I can't even imagine what that experience like underwater and hearing God speak to you and telling you what your what your mission, your life mission is. That's incredible. Um, mm-hmm. But I want to you mentioned that in Indonesia, the elder generation has seen mm-hmm. how, um, you know, I guess climate change has affected their lives. But I feel stateside. Um, I feel like the older generation may kind of be skeptical of climate change or they don't think that it will have any effects in their lifetime. So how do you talk to someone from an older generation or someone who's skeptical about climate change? Hmm. That's a great question. And I guess for context, one thing I should say is it was also a connecting point for me in Indonesia because I was seeing another community of color be disproportionately impacted by climate yes, change. Right. Um, the older generation, uh, people here in America do not see everything around the world. Mm-hmm. Um, here in America, we have um, frontline communities. Frontline communities are communities of color, low income communities, coastal communities, and those are all disproportionately impacted by the intersectional effects of climate change. You also have different demographics who are affected. So this is from women um, to children, to the elderly, to disabled, um, LGBTQ plus, um, to uh, your socioeconomic status. Um, This makes you more vulnerable. And um, when you are talking to someone who um, the word you used was skeptical, Mm -hmm. um, which we could break that down multiple ways. So um, for skeptical, my immediate thought is, okay, they just don't know about it. So for a lot of times, it's about raising awareness around the issue itself. Um, Sometimes people just don't know, you know, and, and that's all it is. Right. Then you go into a different version of skeptical. Um, Is it because they hear the word climate change? And despite all of the science out there, despite them walking outside of their doors, you know, in the fall and the sky was orange, they don't want to believe climate change is going on. Mm -hmm. Well, that's okay. We do know that if you say the words changing climate, they will be more receptive to you. Um, Oh. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Um, So... There, there's a lot of times when you're dealing with policy and advocacy, you have to analyze what language are people receptive towards. So people mm-hmm. actually study that um, and they will do surveys, you know, like, would you have a conversation with someone if they said this word? And then the next slide, it says literally the same sentence, but in a different way. Um, and I think that's when you start to get people to learn more. Um, the other part of this 
when people are skeptical, I think is um, skeptical about what action they can take. Right. Um, and tied into that is like, well, why should I care about it? I'm having to worry about my life, you know, right. because police violence goes on and being a black woman, I am going to, you know, be more at risk for that. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing is, the same communities who are disproportionately impacted by climate change are disproportionately impacted by all of these social justice issues. And so you do have to care about it. But how you talk to someone and show them, like, why should you care is a lot of times I will do in um, when I'm speaking to other black women, for example, um, you know, people people from back home and they're like, Jasmine, talk to us about climate change. And I'm like, well, this is why you need to care, because there's a complete link between African-American women having higher percentages of premature births, miscarriages, um, and that is due to climate change. Why mm -hmm. is that? That's because we are more likely to live in areas or work in areas that are higher pollution um, and sit by a landfill, um, not enough accessibility to sustainable practices. Um, and so it's affecting our health, which then affects the fetus and the baby's health. That's why we need to care. This is an intersectional issue. It's not just affecting the environment. It's check, It's affecting our finances. It's affecting our housing, our food insecurity, um, where we live, if we have to migrate. Um, it's affecting the sociocultural um, perspectives and the racial tensions. It's affecting all of it. And this is why you hear people say climate justice is racial justice, is housing justice, is immigrant justice. That's why you hear all of that, because it's completely intertwined. Yes. Yes to all of that. Um, I wrote a post for Juneteenth about how um, climate change affects communities of color. And there are so many things that you wouldn't even think about, like... Um, most of the time, uh, communities of color are like in food deserts. And mm -hmm. as, the clim as climate change increases, food insecurity will also increase. And right now it's estimated that about 30 to 40% of food is wasted in America, most of which happens on the retail level. Um, and in 1996, the B Bill Emerson Good Samaritan Food Donation Act was passed, which protects companies from liabilities when donating unused food that would have gone to waste. However, most suppliers still would rather throw that food away rather than donating it. Um, do you have any ideas on how we could encourage grocery stores to donate food rather than letting them go to waste? Well, um, I mean, when you say when you say grocery stores, then one, if we're talking about a mom and pop grocery store, then you got to yeah. talk to the owner, the little right, the right. manager. OK, right. So you yeah. got to know them. If it's like Big Macs and Monroe, then, you you know, you got to go talk to Mac. OK, <laughs> um, I don't know if that's actually his name, but um, and then if you're talking to like, I don't know, what are some big grocery stores Kroger. like Albertsons, Whole Foods, mm -hmm. Kroger, Costco, then you're going to have to talk to corporate. You know, like right. that's where those decisions are made. So between those two, um, I think one of the big things, especially for the corporate, um, but even for the, the small town family owned grocery store, um, building in incentives. So government incentives for these grocery stores to be donating unused food. Um, secondly, I would say... Um, having them having these grocery stores partner with local environmental justice organizations right um you know who are doing the work on the ground who are already connected to the various communities um who know people who have needs um so that way it really feels more like a community level effort rather than this is something coming down from the big dog mr corporate you know, going down on us. No, this is like a community effort. We all feel part of it. Um, and I would say also it's about, um, it's about making sure this is kind of connected to the accessibility 
part, um, this might be getting away from your question, sorry, but the food deserts, um, you know, a lot of times people are not within a one mile radius of a grocery store. Um, and then they are also, when they go to the grocery store, stuff is not healthy. Um, Mm -hmm. and the healthier brands are expensive um, they are not affordable. And so things should also be, um, I mean, look at the demographics of neighborhoods. You know, if you're dealing with a neighborhood that's upper class, you know, and I might sound radical with this, but upping the prices of, of your of your groceries. And if you're in a neighborhood that's not, um, you know, the average income yeah. it is middle class, lower class, then your groceries are appropriate to that. Like a sliding um, you, scale grocery store. Wonderful. Sliding like scale that. grocery store, uh-huh. you know, um, but who's going to have an issue with that? You know, like why, why is there a huge issue going on right now with people who are extremely wealthy being taxed? They don't mm-hmm. want to be taxed. Mm-hmm. So a sliding scale, you know, those are the same people who are going to have a problem with that. And right you know, these are the types of things that we need to do to make it a better livable society for us all. Because it's not that the earth isn't going to be okay. The earth has shown us that it's going, the earth is going to live and it's going to be okay. It survived yeah. five mass extinctions. It's right. currently in the sixth one right now. Right. And right now it's just us as human beings trying to figure out, well, are we going to like survive this, you know, like, are my great grandchildren going to be on earth? Like that is the main question here. Right. Um, and so grocery stores have to step up. You, you, You need to know who are you catering your business to grocery stores also need to step up, whether it's the owner, the manager, corporate themselves, um, the products that they have inside of their grocery stores, tell them if the prices are hiked up, you, you can't just like, be selling, I don't want to name a product because they're actually in the news right now. So I was about to say them. Um, (laughs) You don't want to have some sort of a a milk. You don't have a milk, you know, Mm -hmm. and you are charging outrageous numbers, but then you're trying to advocate for climate justice. It doesn't Mm -hmm. match up. Right. It doesn't match up, you know? So what are you doing? Are you just saying that you're advocating for climate justice, you know, using propaganda? So it sounds good. It sounds nice. And that climate justice organizations will partner with you, but everyone sees through it. You know, this, you you can't do that. You're like, we say for relationships, sorry, I like to make things very relatable. So, Mm -hmm. you know, when you say for relationships, you don't want your man to just be talking like his actions need to be showing the same thing as his words. Exactly. And that's what we believe. So these brands, these grocery stores, their actions need to step up. Yep, absolutely. A hundred percent agreed. Um, so I guess we were talking earlier about how climate change is affecting communities of color. Mm. What obviously we talk about doing a lot of, you know, individual action, like drinking from a water bottle and this and that. And of course, voting is going to help make a difference. But sometimes it feels like, you know, voting, it only happens every now and then. And then even if you vote for someone who's blue, they will still do what they want to do anyway. And you may not see a change in your community. So what are some ways that people can um, inspire change or make a difference in their community? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, you know, every great social justice movement started on the local level. So people need to know that that is power, (laughs) you know, like you have as, as people, I was at a rally earlier and someone said, people, um, people are the power. And that's a true statement. Um, power literally resides inside of each and every one of us. And I think something that we do very cool here at Our Climate is that our student leaders have showcased that activism shows up a variety of ways. Um, It's not just that you stand in the street with a poster. You can do that still, but like there's more ways. You can be on social media. You can have podcasts. You can create, you know, um, Instagram carousel posts or TikToks or Reels. Um, you can get in front of your elected official. 
um, a lot of times people have thought, even just with what you stated of voting as in the main election happens every four years and we have midterms in between that. Mm -hmm. Um, And then you have your local elections, but voting is where it starts. Voting is not where it ends. Um, And people forget that, you know, we have to, it is our responsibility to hold our elected officials accountable. If you don't write them, if you don't tweet them, if you don't call them and all of those are available, go on their websites, they have their contact information. Um, then that's on you as an individual, as a family, as a community. Um, You are responsible for that because regardless of if you voted for that person or you didn't vote for that person or you didn't participate in voting, they represent you. And that's what people need to understand. They represent you. You reside in their district, in their um, parish, in their constituent. You are their constituent. And so what you have to say, it matters. On the local level, attend those city council meetings. Get yourself on the agenda. They lay it out for you how you how to do that. You know, um, you can have ample time in preparing for your agenda item. So you go there one meeting just to get yourself on the agenda. Two weeks later, you're on that agenda and you bring in your community with you. So you're the spokesperson and you're speaking about it, but that's bringing attention to it. You as an individual citizen of this country or a resident of this country, you have the ability to write. Write an LTE, which is a letter to the editor. Write an op-ed and submit them. If you go on news outlets, they will tell you how to submit an op-ed, how to submit an LTE to that certain person. They'll tell you the email you need to send it to. You have the power to do that. It's all in your hands. Use it. Um, Use your voice, you know have conversations at the dinner table, at your happy hour. We're all trying to be out and have hot girl summer. I'm on warm girl (laughs) spring right now, but you know, we're all trying, (laughs) we're all trying to be out. So, you know, have the conversation because it affects us. So just like how we want to talk about like, oh, I can't believe, you know, the former administration did this and that. Who cares? They're gone. Let's talk about now. Let's talk about what we can do in our community. Get moving. Volunteer. Look up Environmental Justice Org in near me. Google that. That's all you need to do. Google it and then volunteer. We are in a hybrid setting right now, but you have opportunities to volunteer both in person and virtually. So do that. And volunteering isn't just where you know, you go one day. There's a lot of organizations out here who have volunteer programs so you can remain engaged. It doesn't just mean donating, but if you do want to donate, you can head to www.ourclimate.us and hit that donate button. Um, But it's not just that, you know, it's about getting engaged with the people that you're working with. And there's something to be said for whenever you are working with your family, you know, establish like two two week two um two Saturdays out of the month we're volunteering as a family. Do you know how great that would be? Oh my goodness. You're involving your family, then you guys are enjoying it as a family unit or you get your girlfriends and oh we're going to go we're going to volunteer here. You know, like that's what I would like to do. It's my day. let's do brunch and then let's go volunteer. Um and This is how we become active citizens and residents of this country. Um, But if you just sit on your butt and you complain and you say, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do it. No, use the use Google (laughs) and listen, listen to podcasts. There's so many podcasts. There's so much information that is actually out there. That's true. Um, And people who cite their sources. So check them. You know, that we need to keep learning as people. Continuous learning is a true thing. Um, And there's so much that can be done on the community level. Advocate for affordable, sustainable housing. Advocate to your local grocery store. Hey, I saw the prices were this much. Have you thought about lowering that price? Have you thought about um, bringing in these brands because this would be not just better for the environment, but better for our bodies as people? Because back to the same people who live in food deserts, if you live in a food desert, there's a complete link to the amount of obesity that's in that same um, that same radius. And 
obesity, obesity, excuse me, and diabetes affects what population the most? The black population. Right. You know, it's, it's all connected. So it is our responsibility to hold our elected officials accountable, to get off our butts and to volunteer and to make sure that we're raising awareness to the issue. Yes. Wow. You listed so many great ways that people can get involved. And I totally agree with you about um, involving yourselves in local organizations. I live in the suburbs in, um, of Metro Atlanta. And recently, <laughs> <laughs> recently they, they put out a survey for how we expect to see the city grow, I think, in the next 10 or 20 years. And in a city of 40,000 people, less than 1,000 people responded to that um, survey. And so that really made me realize that even though this is a red county, the city may be, you know, starting to turn blue, but the county is red. And even, you know, even though there's that, I still feel like that I can go out and go to City Hall and get on the agenda, like you said, and have an impact. So those are really good points. <laughs> exactly. You you yeah. can you you can get off your butt, Ariel, and go get involved and tell all your friends yep. in your suburb outside of Metro Atlanta. That was hilarious. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and there's there's so much for for y'all to do and like yeah. i think one of the cool things is when people start to become really engaged it's it's really fun like my boyfriend my partner he it's not that he didn't know about climate change prior to me being in it or me us being together it was more so it wasn't part of his like daily life cuz he works in a whole different sector so Nowadays, I wake up and some of my first emails are from him, not on a personal note, but about climate change. Like, did you know this? Blah, blah, blah. And so that's the type of impact, you know, you make. I get messages from random extended family like, Jasmine, you have me all in the environment now. Like, do you see what's happening here? Um, Are you talking about this on the Hill? And I'm like, how do you know about this before me? And it's wow. because they're they're so into it. Like, and and that's that's what I want. And that's what you, Ariel, sustainable um, brown girl, that's what you are doing with this podcast. You're raising awareness. And so, you know, you take it a step further as an individual and you get out there and, you know, get involved in the suburbs. That's <laughs> cracking me up. Um <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, turn turn that 1,000 out of 40,000 to, you know, more like a 10,000 level. Start your right. own little movement, you know? Right, right. Um, Yeah, exactly. Um, so uh, I guess now I kind of want to talk more about our climate. So what exactly do you guys do and what are some ways that young people can get involved in environmentalism? Yeah. So um, you gave a great intro to what our climate is. Um, Our climate started off in 2013 um, as a statewide campaign. This was in Oregon. Um, and it was when student leaders and adult allies used artwork as a medium, um, a powerful medium, in fact. And what they did was they painted these mosaic art tiles um, and really reflecting on, you know, what climate change means to them, how is it impacting their community. Um, and they put all of the art tiles together and they formed this 125 foot salmon mosaic and they marched to the Oregon State Capitol. Um, and so this was artivism, you know, art action. And yes. um, they also spoke to their elected officials on the Capitol. Um, and many were receptive to hearing what young people had to say, but also interpreting the artwork because artwork is a powerful medium just because of the fact that you as an artist, you are drawing your perspective. Secondly, whomever looks at it, it's up to their own interpretation in addition to whatever the artist may have meant. Um, And it's also not overbearing. That's the other thing. It's not overbearing. 
Um, so it's, it's welcoming in a way. I'm welcoming what your thoughts are in regards to this. Um, and so in 2016, we, um, the movement grew. And then in 2016, we gained 501c3 status, um, becoming an, a national nonprofit. Um, we did the put a price on it national campaign, which was focused on carbon pricing. Um, and then we, we were continuing to expand. So we were in the state of Washington, Oregon, Nebraska, Florida, Massachusetts, and New York. Um, and now we're in, we are still in all of those states except for Nebraska, um, we advocate for science-based and equitable climate policy solutions. Um, we are now rooted in three policy principal areas. So environmental justice legislation, renewable energy targets, and corporate polluter fees, AKA carbon pricing. Mm-hmm. Um, and we run a leadership development program. So we deal with kids who are high school and college students, roughly ages 14 to 24. Um, and we have a field representative program, a fellowship program, and a field advisor program. The fellowship program is really um, our bread and butter, being that these are the kids who work um, more hours and um, they are doing heavier loads of projects. Um, field representatives are usually for kids who are just dipping their toes into the climate justice movement. And field advisors are ones who normally have gone through um, the fellowship program and then act as mentors to our fellows and field representatives. Um, I like to say OC is the catalyst for young people becoming um, visionaries, activists, and leaders in their own communities. Mm -hmm. Um, A couple examples of those are Sharona Schneider from Oregon. Um, She is currently a field advisor, so acting in that mentoring role. Um, And she also runs her own organization called Tuesdays for Trash, Um, it started off as an initiative and it's now gone international. Um, so as you can imagine, it's about picking up trash in your own community. Uh Um, yes, it started where it could only be on Tuesdays, but people can do it whatever day of the week you want. Um, and you could pick it up with your friends. You could pick it up with your family members, with your church, with your school. Um, but it's really getting people out there and being mindful of, what's in their community, you know, like not just driving by a park that's full of trash. We want green spaces that are nice for our kids. Um, And then another example is Josie Helm. Um, She was a field advisor and a fellow in New York. um, And she is now our federal policy intern. Um, She started Black Students Demand Change. Um, So she um, is from New Jersey, but attends private school in New York City. And um, this initiative is bringing up the inequitable issues that occur within New York City private schools for black and brown folks. Mm. Um, And, you know, it's just really great to see how these young people have grown, um, not just as individuals, but leading into their professional lives. Um, And that's what we want, because yes, we're helping you develop as leaders, but we're also giving you some of those professional nuggets of how to operate in this world, um, how to how to raise your profile, you know, um, how to amplify your voice. Um, for some people, that's behind a computer screen. For other people, it's writing a book. For other people, it's starting their own organizations. Um, it's being behind a, a camera and, and filming the storytelling. Um, Storytelling is another huge thing we do. Um, I mentioned earlier, one of the things that you can do as an individual is writing op-eds and LTEs. Our students do this day in and day out, whether they're a field representative, a fellow, or a field advisor. Um, In fact, we had a couple of um, student leaders from our Florida program. They were featured in Teen Vogue um, a month and a half ago. Yeah. So, you know, our kids... I refer to them as our frontline climate warriors. They're doing things. You know, they are out here making moves, making an impact. Um, And it's because they have this like not scared attitude. Um, Even even if they're introverts, they're not scared because their future is on the line, that that's what's going on right now. Mm -hmm. Um, 
you know, because majority of them, they're Gen Z and Mm -hmm. they, they are truly worried about what is the world going to look like? Like, am I going to be able to get old? That's what they are asking themselves. Um, and, and so, I mean, kind of tying again to us as individuals, we are also responsible for helping them get there, you know, um, as an older adult, yeah, I'm I am responsible for helping helping them get to becoming an old person. You know, like I want them to be grandmas and grandpas. Um, right. You know, like if you break it down, really, like yeah, everyone should experience being a grandparent. Like you know, right. like um, and yeah, it just it's been really great being um, the leader of this organization. It will be a year um, for me next month. Um, July 1. So um, next month, I mean, next week. Um, So (laughs) um, yeah, it's been, it's been a wild ride. I did not think that I was going to get a new job in the middle of a pandemic, um, (laughs) nor a new job that would be leading an organization in the middle of the pandemic. So it has been exhilarating. Yes. Congrats on reaching this milestone. And I love that um, our climate is working with young people because they truly are the future. And like you said, they don't have that fear that, you know, maybe we as, you know, once you get to be in your late 20s and 30s, you kind of are like, oh, is what I'm going to do make a difference? But, you know, having giving them a jumping off point from such a young age is great because now they'll have all the tools they need to really make a difference. So I love that. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. And one thing that I want to get your opinion on, I know we're running out of time, but what do you think political leaders should be doing immediately in regards to mitigating the effects of climate change? I know that's like a loaded question because there's so <laughs> many different things, but what, uh, personally, Jasmine, what do you think is most important? Oh, that's so loaded. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's such a loaded question. Um, so I like to look at everything with the environmental justice lens. Um, for me, first, it's about direct investment back into frontline communities because those are, those are the ones who have been the most impacted. Um, secondly, it's about job training. So we're wanting to change everything over to, you know, renewable energy and or clean energy. Um, and that'll be a can of worms if I open that up. So just <laughs> note those two. Um but we, there has to be training, you know, for so many people who would transition, excuse me, transition into these jobs. Um, and they also, it's not just having the training, but it's having paid training for them because who is going to want to leave a job that they've been paid for, regardless of it's messing with their health, it's messing with the environment, if they're not going to have those two weeks of paid training. Mm -hmm. So we need to make sure that we have that. Um, I think it's also, um, you're starting to see it, but like having these um, round tables, advisory councils of young people, of um, community leaders and activists um, and experts um, really making decisions, um, being part of that decision making process. So not being tokenized and there's one, maybe two in the room, um, but that they fill the room, they have the microphone and they're able to sign the dotted line and and lead the discussion because, you know, people want to actually hear what they have to say and implement what they have to say. Um, And then really addressing, you know, the inequities that, that go on within frontline communities. Um, what are we going to do about that? Whether it's the climate gentrification in Miami to um, to the um, unfair or lack of access to healthcare for people in Cancer Alley, Louisiana. I mean, these are the types of things that that we have to address um, to affordable, sustainable housing. You know, Section 8 housing should not be Section 8 housing. It should be affordable. It should be sustainable um, and implementing some of those best practices. Those are my top things. Yeah, that was a well, really loaded question. 
Yeah, I know you did great. Those are those are really good points. Um, mainly, what I took from that is uh, helping communities of color <laughs> and low wage workers who you know who may be uh, you know transitioning to green energy. <laughs> Yeah, that was a great summation. <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right. My last question for you, Jasmine, is what does it mean to you to be a sustainable brown girl? Oh, that's a lovely question. Um, <laughs> to be a sustainable brown girl. Hmm, what does that mean to me? It gives me warmth, one. Mm -hmm. um, and when I think of the word sustainable I don't just think of the environment. I think of my mind, my body, my spirit, and my health. Um, I think it's very, very important for us to take care of ourselves um, as individuals, particularly those of us who work on social justice issues, because um, when I leave work, climate change doesn't leave the earth. <laughs> like It goes with me. Um, so I have to make sure that I'm sustaining myself, um, that I'm feeding into myself. So whether that's a moment of silence, whether that's little family time, um, and then it's tied in with me advocating, um, f advocating about climate change, but not just climate change, advocating about the disproportionate impacts, um, on communities of color and how everything is intersectional. Um, or as I say, it's the circle of life. Um, so just like in Lion King, um, mm -hmm. the intersectionality of climate change is the circle of life. Yeah. Um, so being a sustainable brown girl is something that I take honor in. And it also grounds me and humbles me because I'm bringing all of me when I am a sustainable brown girl. Wow. Love it. That's incredible. Thank you so much for sharing that. <laughs> And thank you so much for coming on today. Let everyone know where they can find you online or in person. So, okay. Um, you can find me in person in Washington, D.C. Um, you can look up uh, our climate at www.ourclimate.us. You can also follow our climate on Instagram at, at our climate leaders. Um, you can follow me on Instagram at Jasmine, that's J-A-S-M-I-N-E, Sharice, C-H-A-R-I-C-E, 1031. I will be changing that handle. Um, and I'm also on Twitter. Um, but look us up. If you're in the D.C. area, look us up. Um, and I wish everyone peace and blessings. Yes. Thanks so much, Jasmine. It was great talking to you. Thank you, Ariel.